Good afternoon, I'm Julian Lee from Munich. Thank you very much for the opportunity to share my ongoing research with you on the interlinked reception histories of the CS80, Yamaha's legendary analog synthesizer, and the science fiction classic Blade Runner. First, to put my work into some context, I am part of the research group Materiality of Musical Instruments, which is housed at the Deutsches Museum in Munich. As part of my fellowship, I have the opportunity to contribute to the group's virtual exhibition, which is scheduled to go online later this year. I developed my current project around the CS80, which Mark Vale has dubbed the heavyweight champion of the early polyphonics. The CS80 was, and is still today, renowned for its remarkable expressivity and playability, while exasperating musicians and technicians alike because of its tuning instability and weight. In other words, a charming but unruly instrument that has reached a mythical status as a beast to be tamed rather than a machine one could perfectly control. So, like many other prized vintage synthesizers, software emulations of the CS80 have been developed. The marketing of the emulations mostly involve name-dropping distinguished musicians who have used the original hardware synthesizers on famous records. What piqued my interest was how frequently and prominently the film Blade Runner is evoked in reference to the CS80. Director Ridley Scott's 1982 film Blade Runner is based loosely on Philip K. Dick's novel, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? It follows Rick Deckard, a Blade Runner, and his mission to retire rogue androids in the dystopian Los Angeles of 2019. His assignment carries ethical complications as the androids, called replicants in the film, are nearly indistinguishable from real human beings. Here is the landing page for the CS80V, a software emulation of the CS80 developed by the French company Arturia. It declares she's a replicant, quoting Harrison Ford's character, Rick Deckard, when he discovers that the woman he had been interrogating, Rachel, is in fact a particularly advanced replicant, which could deliver human responses so convincingly that it nearly escaped detection. The reference is particularly fitting as the soundtrack of the film, composed by Greek musician Vangelis, features extensive use of electronically synthesized brass and string timbres, which carry the warmth and expressivity comparable to those produced by human musicians on acoustic instruments. The expressive synth sounds are very often attributed to the CS80, as it is said to be Vangelis's most favorite synthesizer among his arsenal of instruments at his London studio. Now, Arturia is not alone in drawing on Blade Runner for marketing its emulation of the CS80. In 2009, Memory Moon released its CS80 software emulation, and out of the five demo clips presently featured on its website, the two inspired by Blade Runner are displayed most prominently. Even the plugin by Crackly, named Arminator, features several sounds inspired by Vangelis's work for Blade Runner. Going beyond synth emulations, the Tokyo-based Black Corporation released its rack mount recreation of the Yamaha CS80 in 2018, calling it Deckard's Dream. So noticing how Blade Runner is so embedded in the CS80's afterlife, I decided to focus my research on the cultural legacy of the Yamaha CS80 through the lens of the film Blade Runner. So today, in the first half of my presentation, I explore how instrument related factors encouraged the enduring association between the CS80 and Blade Runner. In the second half, I explore how Blade Runner, especially with regards to its status as a cult film, keeps the CS80's legacy alive. Ultimately, I argue that the cult status of the film and that of its soundtrack, as well as the CS80 as a cult instrument, have synergistically reinforced the cultural significance of the CS80 and Blade Runner in the intersecting fields of science fiction film, electronic music, and analog keyboard synthesizers. More generally, I aim to demonstrate that the cross-fertilization between film music and organology can yield new insights into how artifacts of popular culture acquire meaning. All right, so Blade Runner does not have a fully electronic score. It does, however, feature a significant amount of synthesized sounds, which straddle the boundary between acoustic imitations and distinctively electronic timbres. Curiously, in both scholarly and popular discussions, one, only one instrument is named, the CS80. 
But how do we know which sounds originated from the synthesizer, if indeed at all? After all, as I mentioned earlier, Vangelis had many synthesizers at his disposal. There are no manuscripts that might give us clues about the instrumentation. Vangelis is an autodidact and is known for his improvisational working methods. However, Vangelis has declared that the CS80 was the most important synthesizer of his career, and for him, the best analog synthesizer design there has ever been. With this in mind, the claims of the CS80 featuring prominently in the soundtrack of Blade Runner are at least plausible. If we take a look at the standout features of the CS80 and just listen to the opening sequence of the film, it will become obvious why the CS80 is the prime candidate for Blade Runner's most iconic sounds. So in the interest of time, I'm going to skip ahead to the brassy bits. The inflection of the individual notes of the brass melody strongly suggests that the CS80 was employed, because the CS80 was one of the few polyphonic synthesizers during the time to have a keyboard interface with not only velocity response, but also aftertouch. This key feature allows the player to shape the sound profile of a note after striking the key by varying the pressure exerted. This dynamicity allowed for more expressive performances on the CS80, comparable to that achieved on string, brass, and wind instruments. Besides that, the long downward portamento that somewhat resembles a wailing siren also points to the CS80, in particular its ribbon or slide controller. Not many other keyboards had this feature at the time, and if they did, they were markedly shorter. Most had pitch band wheels with limited range. Here's a short clip with Vangelis demonstrating the CS80's aftertouch. Okay. That's a simple thing. At the same time, at the same time, you can, this sound, you can, you can bring feeling. Change again. Same sound, exactly. Blade Runner's opening sequence, its visuals and its music, is one of the most iconic scenes in the science fiction genre, featuring a highly memorable musical theme, which very plausibly originated from a CSA, as marked by the musical characteristics that are idiomatic for this particular synthesizer. Right, so Blade Runner is a film about blurring the boundaries between man and machine and the associated ethical implications when androids develop human emotions and desires. It is thus inviting to draw parallels between a lifelike replicant and an expressive synthesizer, and in this case, well, the CS80 as the prime candidate. It is an electronic musical instrument that can not only mimic the timbres of acoustic instruments convincingly enough, but is also capable of conveying dynamic nuances, thus producing a score that is emotionally evocative. Indeed, Early reviews of the film highlight how emotionally compelling and soulful the score is, going so far as to say here that it supplies much of the feeling the script and Scott refuse to provide. This association is further encouraged by the change in perception of synthesizer timbres. Analog synths were regarded as cold in comparison to their acoustic counterparts and inhuman in the early 70s. It was only later in the 80s that analog sounds 
started to be called warm. Thus, this analog character of the CS80 invites comparison to the Nexus 6 replicants that display increasingly human-like traits. More human than human, to quote their maker, Eldon Tyrell. This resonance between the narratives surrounding the CS80 with those of the film promotes the embedment of the CS80 as a character, so to speak, in the Blade Runner sphere. So far, we've looked at the CS80's ribbon controller and aftertouch, its warm and rich analog sound. Now, let's consider the CS80 as an analog synthesizer and how it fits as a character not only into the film's soundscape, but also into its wider narrative scope. Blade Runner is regarded as one of the last great science fiction films because of its use of special effects rather than computer generated imagery. Both the film and its soundtrack were thus realized using techniques and technologies that were soon replaced by newer digital ones. This resulted in the film's unified visual and oral style that conveyed a futuristic vision that was already bygone within the decade after its release. In other words, the film production courts nostalgia. The irony is that another Yamaha synthesizer, the DX7, would usher in the era of digital synthesizers with its release in 1983. Furthermore, the film's aesthetic itself is steeped in nostalgia. Blade Runner has the look and feel of a film noir, a genre that emerged in the 1940s. More accurately, the film has a retrofitted aesthetic which, as defined by the visual designer Sid Mead, means upgrading old machinery and structures by slapping new add-ons to them. In other words, the future is old. The adoption of aesthetic and thematic features from both science fiction and film noir genres contributes to the film's simultaneous future-oriented and retrospective mood, which is also reflected in the soundtrack. While the synthetic timbres provide a futuristic soundscape, the use of jazz-infused music creates a nostalgic atmosphere by orally referencing the classic film noir era of the 1940s and 50s. In this respect, Vangelis' score provides the auditory counterpart to the visual features, a retrofitted soundtrack, if you will. Thus, the high congruence between oral and visual styles within the narrative level, meaning the content, and also on the meta-narrative level of its production further strengthens the CS80 Blade Runner pairing. Right, so up until now, we have investigated how the instrument has lent itself well to the film soundtrack. Now, in turn, we will view the synthesizer's reception history through the lens of the Blade Runner legacy, in particular, the film status as a cult classic. So cult cinema can be understood as a kind of cinema identified by remarkably unusual audience receptions that stress the phenomenal component of the viewing experience. Blade Runner is often dubbed a cult classic. The often rehearsed narrative goes like this. After failing at the box office, Blade Runner developed a cult following in home video formats. Studies on cult films can be approached by text-based or reception-based approaches. Both are interlinked and inform one another, obviously. Matt Hill's comprehensive monograph on Blade Runner addresses both these approaches. However, he curiously leaves out the soundtrack, despite the fact that film soundtracks are also important sites of cult fan engagement. In the next section, I build on Matt Hill's observations and extend his approach to examine the cult status of Blade Runner soundtrack and how it in turn has bestowed a cult instrument status on the CS80. Before zoning in on our Blade Runner case study, let's look at what Umberto Eco had to say about what makes a cult film text in general. In order to transform a work into a cult object, one must be able to break, dislocate, unhinge it, so that one can remember only parts of it. Such fragments or rather standout moments are more likely to be poached by fans as they are more quotable. One such part is the so-called tears in rain sequence in which Roy Betty delivers his monologue before expiring or dying, if you will. As Matt Hills notes, such moments and images have the capacity to be lifted out of context or to stand alone 
partly because of the affective intensity they convey, and partly because they encapsulate the film's thematic concerns. Similarly, the music in this scene is highly quotable. The musical material accompanying the Tears in Rain sequence is a variation and extension of the main title's theme. These are the two most melodically well-defined non-diegetic musical passages in the film and are in fact the only two instances in which the theme is heard. I argue that this calculatedly sparing use of the theme right at the beginning and right at, and at the end anchors the music to the impressive and evocative and ultimately quotable scenes. Indeed, the music is audibly electronic in timbre and you would thus need a synthesizer, and ideally the supposed original, the CS80, to replicate that sound, to recapture that iconic moment faithfully. So I recap, because the soundtrack possesses features of cult quotability, being able to stand alone as musical set pieces in their own right, Blade Runner's musical moments are kept in cultural circulation and along with it, the CS80 as its sound source. Now we shall turn to the extra textual features of the soundtrack. Blade Runner, somewhat infamously, has at least seven different versions, which include different theatrical releases, a director's cut, and a final cut. The soundtrack of Blade Runner also has several versions. Bootleg recordings of the soundtrack proliferated, and these continued to do so after the official 1994 release, as the single CD was deemed incomplete. This is an example of textual poaching on the sonic level, where fans appropriate the film's sonic component to create their versions of the soundtrack album. Jamie Saxton has pointed out that collecting soundtracks is an important component of cult film fandom, and it represents one of the many ways films can be cultified across different media cultures. Nonetheless, cult fans have also creatively engaged with film's musical material. Analogous to fan fiction or fan art, there have been also much music in the ambient slash electronica genre inspired by Evangelis' music for Blade Runner. Sexton argues that although many cult cultists have embraced new technologies, there exists a marked enthusiasm for older technologies and practices. The importance of residual technologies within cult film and music cultures is equally applicable, I argue, to analog synthesizers. I agree with Saxton's argument that both all media formats and content can take on renewed meanings within a digital age, in particular how their status can become enhanced within cult communities. And so within the cult of Blade Runner, the CS80 attains the status of a cult instrument. The CS80 is so inextricably linked to Blade Runner that Hans Zimmer and Benjamin Walfish brought back this vintage synthesizer for the soundtrack of Denis Villeneuve's sequel, Blade Runner 2049. Here's a short clip with Hans Zimmer demonstrating the CS80's aftertouch and ribbon controller. The magic of this beast is Ooh. the aftertouch. That, you know, as I press harder, things start happening, and then you could do, I mean, and you can go from, until it becomes completely, just hell. So indeed, the sequel has renewed interest in the film and its soundtrack in more recent times, with the CS80 once again being pushed into the limelight as the star of the soundtrack, of both the original and the sequel. Contemporary observations describe Vangelis' score as mythical, which is fitting, considering how little we know about Vangelis and how he used the CS80 or other instruments. But perhaps it doesn't really matter because the myth is part of the allure. The unsolved mysteries keep the fans searching for answers, their dedication and engagement further reinforcing the cult of Blade Runner and of the CS80 synthesizer. I hope that I've been able to demonstrate how looking at musical instruments through the lens of film music studies has enabled me to elucidate a fascinating aspect of the CS80's history and ongoing cultural legacy. Virtual exhibitions provide the perfect opportunity not to tell an exhaustive story, but perhaps one from a certain angle that is worth exploring at length. And this is what I'm aiming for with my present exhibition. I aspire to show how an analog synthesizers with all their pastness 
are still very much present in the present times. And I wager that they still will be in the future. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take questions now and I welcome feedback on any aspect of my project presented today.